Good morning and welcome to another weekly update. I hope you had a great weekend, the start of a new fun week and uh, some things to talk about. So last week was Microsoft Inspire. Um, not a ton of news for sort of Teams platform development folk um, and that's sort of to be expected. It's a partner conference. It's not a super technical conference um, but there were some things announced that um, are I think worth talking about um, the the kind of main place I think that is worth going to is some of the roundup blog posts. So and there've been a few of those, um, and so let's look at the kind of main one. Um, so this is uh, by Jared Spataro. He's the CVP for Microsoft 365, and we've seen him do posts in the past um, with kind of announcement around what's happening with the platform. And uh, this is worth reading through, but um, lots of it is not of particular interest to Teams platform developers, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I do just want to scroll down to one part which I thought was worth calling out because I haven't really seen it talked up anywhere else, and that's around Microsoft Viva, um, and uh, still obviously uh, of a big interest, of big importance to Microsoft right now and, and spending uh, a lot of time talking about Viva. But this is the interesting thing, new APIs for um, Viva Connections. So uh, no dates on detail, um, but available later this year, Viva Connections APIs to enable partners to integrate with Viva Connections into the dashboard um, so they can enhance kind of the availability of their tooling. Uh, I think this is good. Um, yeah, so again, it says available later this year as a preview uh, means that you can ingest content, you due dates and assign content from learning management systems. So if you've got a learning management system, either an internal one or you know you build them for a living or whatever, um, you could start to bring it into Viva Connections with APIs that are coming later this year, whatever that means. So um, we we'll just have to wait and see on those. Um, and that's kind of it. There's lots of IT Pro stuff. There's lots of business stuff. Um, there's nothing specifically new that I saw announced um, for Teams platform developers other than that. But I will kind of keep an eye on it because sometimes things do get announced um, sort of in sessions and stuff. So it takes a while for them to come out because people have to review all the sessions uh, and they may just get announced rather than being like a full on blog post and just kind of get thrown out there. And actually that's the case for, um, for the next thing I want to talk about, which is kind of a really big deal but there hasn't been um, a big announcement about it yet. And I think there probably will be, um, but maybe we're just being a, a little bit early in catching the documentation and, and just not waiting for the official announcement. But that's why you listen to this channel, right? And that's why you watch this video is because, um, you know, we're kind of trying to keep on touch with uh, all the things that are happening um, and kind of all the information as it comes out. And so this is one of those that I think will be of real interest to lots of people. This is about exporting data from Microsoft Graph Teams data about Microsoft Star Graph at scale. Now I've talked about this quite a few times. There's the transactional APIs. They're like the CRUD ones. So the create, read, update, delete ones. You make a call to go and get some data. You make a call to update some data, whatever else it is. They're okay and they're good and they've got their place for sure. And they do enable lots of great scenarios. However, the thing about them is that they don't work very well at scale. Like there's throttling that comes into play. Um, and if you just want to keep up to date with all the changes that are being made in a tenant, you really kind of have to get into polling. It's not great. Um, it, it's hard for the developer. It's hard for Microsoft because that's a lot of load on the system as well. So they don't really like it. So they bring in throttling and then it all gets harder. So there's lots of things that aren't great about it. And there are workarounds. Um, to do some of that, like Delta queries have come in to, for some of the workloads, um, change notifications, so webhooks have come in for some of them. Um, and then for some other parts of 365, but not Teams for quite a long time, there's been this thing called Data Connect. Now, Data Connect is a way of taking the data that's in Microsoft 365 and pushing it into your Azure tenant um, through uh, Azure Data Factory. So, um, once it's in Azure Data Factory, of course, you're, it's in your Azure tenant. You can do whatever you want with it. You can push it to a serverless architecture. You can push it to some queues, um, or event hubs, and, and do what you will with it. You can push it straight into a database um, for a more kind of traditional method. You've got loads and loads of options. You can analyze it in real time. Loads and loads of things you can do with it. It's your data at that point. Once it's gone into Data Factory, it's, you can then create a pipeline and, and do what you will with it. That's never been available for Teams data um, until now. And that changes now. So let's go to this blog post um, because it's quite interesting. All right, so uh, look at this. So this is uh, Azure Data Factory. And this is exactly the same process that you can go through to set up 
access to your Microsoft 365 data in Data Factory. Uh, but if you go and do that now, and if you follow um, some documentation, so further down here, there's a quick start, which is brilliant, by the way. Um, let me just open it and show you. So this is a quick start that is uh, what I would recommend if you've never done anything with Data Connect and you've never pushed anything into Data Factory before. This will walk you through step by step um, exactly what you need to do to make it all work. The interesting part is that when you come to choose the data that you want from Microsoft 365, there is a new type of data, which is Teams chat data. Yes, this is full on bulk access to every single Teams chat. Pretty, pretty exciting. Um, quite a lot of data, I imagine, for most tenants. Um, anyway, that, you can now choose that as a data type, as a selectable type, type of data um, in Data Factory and have full access to it. You get a ton of information. So you get all the dates and times around when it was created, when it was received. You get the subject, the body, any attachments, the type of it, uh, where it's going to, where it's come from, the tenant ID, lots and lots of information um, as well. So plenty there to make a really good, faithful kind of copy, if you like, of, of the message that got sent. Um, and like I say, you, you get all that as a big JSON blob and you'll get it pumped to your data factory for everything. Now, a couple of things to be aware of. It's not free. Um, so Data Connect does have a charge. Uh, I blogged about this back in May because, again, it was something that kind of got pushed out there quite quietly. Um, so as it went into kind of pre public preview, I think, or possibly into GA, I can't remember, um, they introduced a charging mechanism. Now it's charged per item. So that's worth remembering when you're exporting Teams chat because you're going to get every single message. Um, and if you send a group message, I think then I'm not entirely sure, actually, I'd have to check the um, the data. I'm not entirely sure whether that you get one of these payloads for every message that gets sent. So if you send a group message to five people, do you get five messages or do you get one with lots in the two? I'm not quite sure. I feel like you're going to get five, um, but that's just a guess. So anyway, that means you get charged for five. So anyway, um, so just be aware of that. There's a minimum charging batch size of a thousand items. Um, it's not super expensive. The, like the per item charge is not super expensive, but obviously it does add up because lots of messages. And if you're doing it repeatedly, that is also kind of going to be a problem. Well, not a problem. It's just a consideration, I guess. Anyway, if this is of interest to you, go and check this out. Check the blog post. Um, check out this tutorial because I think it's excellent. And um, yeah. Uh, exciting. I, I think this really fills a gap actually for lots of people who want to bulk export Teams chat data. And I think as well, this gives Microsoft the excuse is the wrong word, the justification to start saying a bit more firmly, hey, those transactional APIs, they're not really meant for polling every single Teams chat in existence in your tenant. We're going to start ratcheting down some of the throttling um, because there's better ways to do this. You should be using change notifications. You should be using Data Connect. You should not be using our transactional APIs. That's my guess. That's just my kind of projection of what I think they're going to do. Um, obviously, yep, we're going to have to wait and see um, what happens with that. All right, next up, and uh, obviously saving the important stuff till uh, till midway through, burying the lead, new emoji. Um, so yes, so I, whether or not you like emoji or you hate them, I think they're here to stay. What's interesting is that Microsoft are um, creating a whole load more of them. They're rewriting all of them. They're going from 2D to 3D, um, and it's going to be across Microsoft 365. So you, you're going to see these surface in Teams, in Windows, in Outlook, in Yammer, and all the other places where emoji show up. I would predict they're going to show up unevenly. So they're going to show up in probably Teams first and then maybe Windows and maybe Outlook later. I don't know. Um, but I don't. I doubt you're going to wake, we're all going to wake up one morning and it's going to be like Emoji Monday and they're going to be everywhere. I think they're just going to trickle out over time. There's a few things that are kind of interesting to me about this. So the first is, I mean, like them or hate them, they're new, they've been redesigned. Um, they're very colourful, they're very bright, um, they're very kind of um, cartoony, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, I mean, great. Um, there's What's interesting is the, the range of new emoji that have come out. And this is kind of interesting because I thought up until now, and it might not be true actually, um, but I thought more or less there was a sort of um, 
uh, a common standard emoji like that there is an emoji like standards body and stuff um i wouldn't say it's quite so far as an iso standard but like there's a yeah there's like a body that that comes up with new emojis and that means that all the manufacturers so apple android like google and microsoft can all kind of implement them the same so so that when you you send someone a message and you use a particular emoji uh, you know it's going to be reproduced on the other side and you're not going to get like a weird square box for an unknown character or something like that it's kind of not clear to me where some of these new emoji are coming from like are they microsoft only implementations and if you use them to send a message to someone um that is kind of off the microsoft network what happens then so some unknown there is that even possible i'm just trying to think it through in my head because like if you're doing it in teams where well, microsoft can implement it even in like the android teams client and the apple teams client they can just implement those emojis themselves so i guess it's fine how does it render in notifications you know all sorts of questions we have what if you can switch to someone off network? So if you're using a Windows machine and maybe an Android and you send a text message to someone that is not in the the Microsoft ecosystem, what happens? I don't know. There's plenty of things to talk through and I'm probably not the best person to figure it all out either. Um, but uh, we're just going to have to wait and see uh, whether, I mean, for all I know, these might be coming into the emoji standards body. I haven't, I haven't checked. Um, and also, you know, um, these are rolling out as well. They're not all going to be here now. I think the timeline is uh, this holiday season for Teams and Windows and then Yammer and Outlook in 2022. And on the screen as well, um, I I guess that they're replacing the paperclip with Clippy. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is true. I mean, it's written down in the blog post, so I guess it's happening. But um, yeah, I've fine whatever um clippy's back that's the return of clippy i couldn't be happier um but so yeah that, that all that stuff's happening as well so look for new emojis uh if you are um reliant on the existing emojis i i hope they kind of stay or the existing ones stay um i don't know you can go and check this blog post it's quite interesting sort of technically interesting not technically um meta interesting i suppose is that it came on a medium blog post not one of the tech community ones or anything like that which is kind of interesting to me um just because uh like it's a slightly weird place like you don't normally see big microsoft announcements happen in medium posts but there we go it's from the design team and i guess like it's less technical isn't it it's slightly a different kind of practice and, and maybe that's where they use that's you know that's the medium they use to kind of communicate their information mm-hmm. don't know but it's interesting all right, I think that's nearly everything from me. Um, if you've made it all the way through this video, then uh, you might be interested in this last thing, which is um, something I put out on Twitter and something I'm going to kind of continue to promote through this week is I'm going to be writing a book and it's going to be about building and developing applications and bots for Microsoft Teams. So taking everything I know about design guidance, implementation, which tooling to use, which scaffolding to use, what type of platform development experience to do when, you know, is it a tab? Should it be a bot? Should it be a messaging extension? Should it be an in-meeting application? Should it be one of the new ones, one of the old ones? How should it look to users? How do you package that up as an app? How do you roll it out? Um, How do you do testing? Uh, All sorts of things. How do you design a good bot? What should you do? What shouldn't you do? I'm going to wrap all of that up in um, in a book. So if you're interested, there is a website you can go to to say that you're interested. That's actually really useful for me because it, it tells me kind of what the levels of interest are. And um, that kind of helps motivate, vote, motivate me as well to kind of get it done. So I've started, I haven't finished, but I'm letting you know about it now because if you've watched all the way through, you're probably going to be interested in this sort of stuff. So you can go to the link, link in the in the notes. It's leanpub.com slash teams dev. Um, you can put your name in there and say, tell me when it's published. I am going to publish early. So um, there is going to be like an early price if you want to get the early version and then like updates are free. So the early you get in, the cheaper it's going to be. Um, and uh, yeah, so if that sounds of interest, go and say you're interested. That would be really useful. Um, otherwise, I will let you know. I'm kind of committing a soft goal to myself that I'm also recording now to try and get it done in 2021. So we'll see. Um, see how that goes. But yeah, that, that would be my plan. All right. That's everything from me. Uh, have a great week, whatever it is you're doing. Um, if you uh, find out some interesting news, you can always let me know um, if anything interesting comes out in the week. Obviously, I'll be blogging about it and then we can talk about it next week. Um, Other than that, have a great week, whatever it is you're doing, and I will talk to you again next time.